I pray that this unlocks faith. I pray that this unlocks faith in your heart, that it, that it unlocks hope, uh, that, it unlo- that it unlocks bravery, courage. Um, we know the 23rd Psalm, and so it's not something we are unfamiliar with as we've been going through it. Uh, to break down every verse and to dig into every verse and to see what David was saying, what God is saying. It's just, to me, I don't know uh, about you, but there is is freedom in knowing that I'm taken care of. Uh, There there is freedom in knowing that God is in control. There is freedom in knowing that His boundaries... ...are safer than my boundaries. Uh, there, there is freedom in knowing all of these things. And so as we dig into today... ...we'll be in Psalm 23. We're going to look at verse 4 today. We're going to break down verse 4. We like this verse. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a comforting verse. It's a powerful verse. It has a powerful visual with it. And I won't get into the visual just yet, but there's just some powerful things, some thoughts to share this morning. But I want to start off by asking you, do you remember the first scary movie you ever watched? Uh, uh, Growing up for me, I'm pretty sure I saw several. Um, I can't name them all. And what I was thinking back then in the 80s when scary movies were really scary... Uh, and not like what you see today. The movies of today, that's all CGI and gore. That's not scary. The 80s were scary. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I, I'm one of the first movies I ever watched in the 80s was the movie Poltergeist. We're talking the original, not the remake, okay? The original uh, movie Poltergeist. And, and it did slightly change my behavior after watching that movie. Because from that day forward, I didn't like dark rooms, Uh, I didn't want to be alone in them, and certainly, and and I never, ever, ever, ever wanted a clown doll. Never. Now, some of you I know are going to get that. Others, you may not get that one. Dark halls, dark rooms, dark spaces. There was always this picture in my mind that something was out to get me. So I wouldn't give it the chance. I have a nightlight on, I keep the door open, whatever I needed to be done, uh, to have done, to comfort myself, I did. Here was the issue. It was the thing that was going to it was the fear of the thing getting me that messed me up. So it wasn't, it wasn't the thing that was going to get me that I was concerned about. It was the fear that had already struck my heart from the thing that I thought was going to get me that had messed me up. And, and so that, that's kind of, in a, in a nutshell, where we're headed this morning. Uh, as we come to part four of this series, we've arrived to one of the singular, most comforting verses of the Psalms, uh, especially when it comes to its use. Most of the time, uh, we use this psalm at funerals. We read it because it's comforting. And yet... There's some things that I want to point out this morning that I think you're going to find that the 23rd Psalm means more to life than it does to death. And and so I want you to hear and and go on this journey with me this morning uh, because there's more than just funeral application for this verse. Verse 4, this is what I'm reading out of the ESV. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now there are a few words uh, that should be here at the beginning. Those words are very simple. They are walk, through, and shadow. And I want to point these things out to you, because these are three words that should be seen as the thrust of this verse. Notice if you, if you remember that David is not writing this as a shepherd, he's writing this as a sheep. 
So he's not writing this from a perspective of someone in charge. He's writing as, as though he were be, uh, his, somebody was in charge of him. As we all know, God was in charge of him. So he's writing this from a completely different perspective. And so the line he mentions here is walking through the valley, indicating life. The lamb is walking and not, not stopping, which means it is not the point of death, but rather the act of the shepherd leads. Can we, can we stop there for just a second? Ladies and gentlemen, life would be so much easier if we would follow the shepherd. Because if, if we were to just take the, the, the initiative to follow the steps as the shepherd leads us, uh, and knowing that he that in his leading, in his supplying, in his sustaining, and all of those words that we've looked at over the past couple of weeks, if we would look at this as the honor of following the shepherd, as the glory of following the shepherd, as as the the privilege of following the shepherd through the same muck that everyone else goes through, but having a different outcome, having a different response, having a different perspective. ...on these things. See, the lamb is walking. He's not stopping. It means it's not the point of death. And this is why I say that while we read it at funerals to bring comfort... ...this is more about life. Because notice, he, he, he does not say, even though I walk through the valley to death... ...he says, I'm just walking through. I, I'm walking through. We... You guys, uh, if, you're, if you know music well enough and songs that we used to sing, this, uh, 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 this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. We see then that this world, this life, and all of these things is just a part of the journey. And so it, it strikes us funny that, uh, that the lamb is walking Walking does not imply hurry. Walking does not imply anything other than just strolling. Ladies and gentlemen, if we had Jesus where we, where we really are supposed to have him, we would walk through life instead of hurry through life, instead of rush through life. And, and the fact is, is he's walking through not only that, but consider where the shepherd would lead. Steep ravines where the sun is blocked out in part by the slopes. But not only that, the wild beasts that await. Think about where he is at. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll let you know this is a real place. It's a, it's a place in Israel that is known to be called this. Not because, uh, um, and really it's, it's, it's not so much a touristy place. In fact, was, as we were driving the southern part of Israel, we drove past it and our guy goes, oh, hey, by the way, that was the valley of the shadow of death. Now, you know us, some Americans who read the 23rd Psalm, that's the one thing I want to see. I want to see the valley of the shadow of death. Do you know what it looked like? It, it looked like a little creek running through, it, it, I mean, just a sliver of land and there were high high slopes on either side. And the, uh, the idea is advantage for the enemy. But really, what it is, is as you walk through that, the, the deeper you would go into that, the more you would realize that the sun was not shining as brightly. It's walking through darkness. And not only do you have to consider that it's walking through darkness, but you've got to consider the wild beasts that are there. David has killed two of these wild beasts. Now, I, I know for you and me, unless you're an outdoorsman, you don't see bears very often, unless you go to the zoo. And you don't see lions very often, unless you go to the zoo. But in Israel, they run wild. So here is David. Even though I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death where I can't see where the enemy is at, but I know the enemy is there, the enemy I'm talking about is the predators that will jump on me at any second to try and destroy me or stop me or whatever it is. It doesn't matter. It feels like death, but it's not. Because notice he says it's a shadow. A shadow of death is not death. 
It's just that it awaits. Remember what I said about being afraid of the thing that was going to get me versus being afraid uh, of the chance that it might, instead of being afraid of death, being afraid of what death might do? This is where you find David. Because in that place, a sheep, their lifespan doesn't take long. Predator will take them out. A uh, uh, predator will come after them. While the valley sits in the shadow of death, understand that it is not death that is the foe here, especially for the believer. It's the evils that taunt us in life that are the real threat. And I don't want to start out morbid today or depressing, but the reality is, is that Scripture tells us in Hebrews 9, 27, I, I want you to hear this because I'm sick and tired of the church being afraid of dying. We're so afraid of death. The Bible's very... 9.27 says, It is appointed for a man or a woman once to die. So you need to understand something about death. It's an appointment that you are obligated to keep. One time. It's an appointment. It is appointed for you. That means it's an inevitable conclusion. There is something about this life that is terminal. So face it. The best thing you could do is walk out without fearing death, knowing that death is not even the end. Because if you have Jesus in your life, you already have victory over that appointment. You know, I don't, I don't like going to the doctor or the dentist or the eye doctor or anybody that's going to poke and prod and mess with me. I don't want them telling me what's wrong with me. Can I, can I be honest and tell you that uh, I, I lived with gallbladder issues a lot longer than I should have if I'd have gone to a doctor? In, in fact... Uh, my my family doctor, Stacy's mom. Everybody's family. <laughs> Everybody's family doctor. If you don't know, that's 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 the doctor we consult, Nana. Long before I had surgery, long before Stacy woke up at six o'clock in the morning and found me in our bathroom white as a sheet in pain. She had told me about a year before that. Sounds like your gallbladder's got problems and you probably need to have it taken out. Well, I'm not going to the doctor because I'm not going to let them poke and prod and tell me what I need to do because when I go to the doctor, not only is it bad news, it costs money to be told bad news. So I don't, so I don't want it. So I'm not going to the doctor. I'm not going to go to a dentist to tell me I got bad teeth. I know! Y'all, just, just roll with it, okay? It's like, Pastor... So I don't, so, so if there's pain, I refuse it. I, I don't, I don't want to go to the doctor. I don't want to get it looked at. It will pass. Give me some, some ibuprofen. I'll be okay. Rub a little Tylenol on it. It's going to be all good. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm going to do that. And, because, it, and, it's, and it's, not, it's not the issue. It's just the fear of the news. It's not the issue that scares me. I got Jesus. Tell me, I, look, I, 20 years ago, I had stage four cancer and beat it. So I get it, all right, as far as that goes, I, I, I understand. But ladies and gentlemen, we walk in this life afraid of the one appointment we have. We walk through this life and, we're, and we are more scared of death than anything else. And David is saying right here, he says, even though I walk through death's shadow, he doesn't dismiss that death doesn't exist. He knows it does. And he knows that the chances of death coming after him as a lamb are by far high stakes. But even though I'm walking through this life and death is constantly at the door trying to take me out, ladies and gentlemen, you've been dying since you took your first breath physically. 
So even though I walk through this valley and even though I'm, I'm going through and, and I've had my trials and my tribulations and my troubles and I know that there's enemies on all sides and I know that they're all trying to destroy me and I know that the end result is death, even though I walk through it all, I will not be afraid. I will not fear. I will not allow things to take up residence in my mind. Do you know the worst thing about fear is fear draws conclusions before the proof ever comes through. Fear will tell you the most devastating story before the, before the facts actually come in. That's where what if happens. Well, what if this and what if this and what if this? That's actually fear talking. That's not always wisdom, ladies and gentlemen. Wisdom is, is yes, seeing those possibilities, but not being afraid of them. Fear is all about playing the what if game. Well, what if this happens and what if that happens and what if I don't do that or what if I do that or what if it, what, what goes on if this happens or, or, or what if the doctor says this or what if the job says that or what if and none of it has ever happened but we've already gotten so scared that we stand still. Do you know the one thing about fear is that it causes you to... That's the truth. I won't take a step forward. I won't take a step backward. I won't move to the side, either side. I won't do it. Because fear has told me the end of the story that victory is writing for me. Mm, that was deep, y'all. Oh, my goodness. I thank God that death is not permanent. It's an appointment we, that we all must take. I'm sorry to be so ugh, on that, but re realize it. Do we necessarily know when it is? No. James tells us our lives are a mist, it's gone, and then it's gone. We know the who, the what, and the why, but we cannot control the when. That being said, we do get to control the how. We meet that appointment. You do get to control the how. Because here's what I want you to understand. For the believer, the best way to handle the how is to walk through this life fearlessly overcoming the shadow. If you want to be victorious in this life, it's time to start walking in the overcoming power uh, and being overcoming by fearlessly, excuse me, fearlessly overcoming the shadow. And how do we do that? Well... I'm glad you asked because David gives us a few things. Well, let me go back here. Webster's Dictionary defines a shadow as the dark figure cast upon a surface by a body intercepting the rays from a source of light. In other words, it is something that just happens to be in the way of the full brilliance of the sun. Now, an alternate fa translation found in a few manuscripts of the Psalms calls this place a valley of deep darkness, which can be true. Anyone ever found themselves in a dark place? Not literally, but in your mind, your soul, even your spirit. The whole dark place has in reality gotten so many believers and unbelievers alike. I don't know about you, but I want victory over the dark places. If David is writing from the perspective of a sheep, then consider the life of the sheep for a moment. Every day that they are grazing in the fields is an opportunity for predators to come and get them. The possibilities grow exponentially when a sheep goes astray. But you know what's worse than going astray? Listen, what's worse than going astray? Being close enough to the community to feel connected, but far enough away to be on the edge. You see, this is the worst place because when a predator sweeps them up and devours them, it was in the sight of the herd. I've got a reason for saying that, and, and you'll, you'll get that in, in just a second. Can I, uh, let me just take a side note for a second and tell you that you cannot overcome by yourself or try to play the fence of connected disconnection. 
This is not a game of he loves me, he loves me not. This is real and eternity hangs in the balance. Get in the body and bloom where you are planted. Get connected and quit playing games. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, the worst thing about the church is being a part of the community but on the edge so that you're so connected to the community but the enemy still devours you in sight of the community, which tells me that you're connected enough to say, oh, I belong, but disconnected enough to care when they begin to call on me to pull me in. That's a good word. That is a good word. We call this the deep end. And, and for, for you ladies that are familiar, it's you staying in the house when it's on fire. Though the community is saying your house is on fire, get out. You stay. It's being connected enough to say, oh, I belong. But disconnected enough to ignore the calling from danger. And so, this is not a game, church. This is, this is serious business. Serious business when it comes to the church, when it comes to your walk with God, when it comes to connection. And what brings peace to David as a sheep connected to his shepherd as he walks through the valley? He notes it in verse 4. His confidence is not in his own ability, but it is in God's ability. So here's how he does it. Number one, he relies heavily on the priority of presence. He relies heavily on the priority of presence. Listen, presence requires communication that is more than singing. Prayer is the key. Praying in the spirit and praying with my understanding. Absolutely get into a worship space. Live a life of praise and worship. Give God the attaboys that he is due and the adoration of humble on your face surrender that he alone is worthy of. But you got to pray. God does indeed inhabit the praises of his created Adam. He designed him not just for worship, but fellowship. He made him and converted and cared for his needs. He made Eve. And in return, Adam could honestly say that the God of the universe wasn't just his creator, but was also his confidant, was his friend, his father, his shepherd, his reason for being, his conscience, his comforter, his king. He was his God. Who knows me by name and I know him. And understand the communication is not one-sided. It's a two-way street that requires intentionally listening, listening for the shepherd's voice instead of talking over him. Listening is an integral. It's hearing without waiting for your chance to speak. People who just listen long enough to interject when you are speaking to them do not care about what you are saying. And I wonder how often we treat God like this. Understand, and I, I, I know this is a little bit headier than, than maybe you were expecting, but ladies and gentlemen, practicing the presence of God is a vital part of your Christian experience. Having a priority and placing a priority on the presence of God. He says, I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death. I'm walking through this life. I know that death hangs in the balance. I know it's lurking. It's constantly got angles. It's doing all of those things. But watch, I'm going to walk. Fearlessly. And in my fearlessness, I'm overcoming the shadow. And the reason I'm overcoming the shadow, he says it, you are with me. He doesn't beg. He doesn't say on the chance that you might be. He says without, without skipping a beat, you are with me. Here you are walking next to me. There's communion that we have. There's presence that is in my life that I know is deep-seated and deep-rooted within me. And it's because I purposely and intentionally get into his presence. I, I got to tell you, just as I was praying um, uh, before, before standing up to, to preach this morning, I, I said something to the effect of, and you could, and you you remember it, uh, Lord, we just welcome you into this place. And I got checked. 
You don't welcome God into what already belongs to him. He welcomes you. Ladies and gentlemen, you are the temple of God. You don't invite God into his own temple, it's his. He invites you. And it struck me, I was like, you're right, God. You're absolutely right. I am removing that from my prayer usages. I am no longer going to pray, welcome into this place. Lord, we welcome you. Lord, you are welcome. We used to sing that song, welcome to this place. Wrong song, should never, should never have written it. Why? Because it's absolutely wrong. If we are the temple of God, we don't invite him. He's already here. We're glad he's here and that he has opened the door for us to come in. We practice the presence of God. We place a priority. Folks, I, I, I need you to understand this, that the presence of God, if you can do church without the presence of God, then it's not church. If, if, you, can do, if you can have messages and, and, can, and can do everything without the presence of God being a priority, then ladies and gentlemen, you're not walking with the God that you think you are. You're walking hand in hand with yourself. And David, as the, in, in the position of a sheep, uh, understanding his uh, uh, allegiance to his shepherd, says, I've got I've to be in his presence at all times. I, I, can't, I can't stand not being in his presence. In fact, in a later psalm, he says, don't take your presence away from me. So he thrived. On the presence of God. How did he cultivate that? Through worship, absolutely, but definitely through prayer. Ladies and gentlemen, prayerlessness is probably the number one sickness in the church. Amen. It's a cancer. Because a church that prays is a church that's powerful. And a church that prays is a church that has its ear to the ground and hears what God is saying. And is able to follow where God is leading. Is able to know and identify. Remember, recall the past several weeks. What can a sheep do? A sheep recognizes the voice of his shepherd. And will literally not listen to the one who is trying to be the voice. It's, it's John 10, 4, good buddy. I know the voice of the shepherd. He knows it. Not only is it because he communicates, it's because he listens. The, the, the second craziest thing about the church is that, ladies and gentlemen, we're so afraid of silence. We're so afraid of it. Like if I were to stop talking, most of you would be like, say something. One of you would go, amen, brother, because you'd have to fill the emptiness with sound because for some reason we don't like to listen because it requires silence. So we fill the air with our own words and our own, and, and God's like, but can I, but can I, can I, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, you miss your assignment when you're still talking. You, you, you miss your promise when you're still talking. You miss my provision when you're still talking. Hmm. You miss direction when you're still talking. So church, don't be afraid of the silence either. Practice praise and worship. Practice in prayer. Take moments to just be quiet and listen. He speaks. Secondly, David takes comfort in what God brings with him. See, it's not just his presence it's what God brings that accompanies his presence. What does he bring? He brings one, he brings a rod. He says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. He's, he brings a rod. Now understand, a rod is for smiting. Smiting is a biblical word for hitting. For beating. Oh, wait a minute, that's another word for hitting. That's terrible. A shepherd's implement. It's a club for mustering or counting sheep. It, is, it, it also carries a meaning of a scepter or mark of authority. And there's one other definition that I'm going to get to, and that's the whole reason I talked about being connected and disconnected. So we'll get to that at the end, but I, I want you to hear this uh, right now. He, 
he is comforted by the fact that God carries a big bat with him. In fact, the rod, it didn't have to just be this big old staff like, we've, like we look at with the hook on it, the, 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 the stereotypical shepherd with a, with a big long stick and a hook on it. The, the, the rod was actually like a club, and it was long enough to where it hung off of his belt or his sash that he wrapped around himself. It hung here. It was quick for him to grab. It's something that he used, yes, occasionally to, pro to poke and to prod his sheep, but it was the one thing that when he saw a predator coming, he would get in front of his sheep and he would swing. And he would hit the predator, and he would make sure that the predator felt it, ladies and gentlemen. It wasn't just a, stay away. Uh, I need you to understand, when God comes against your enemies, it's to destroy them completely, not to just push them away. No, we ain't going to get no amens on that one. Oh, but, but we've got to understand that he, he comfort, I'm comforted knowing that my God carries a big stick. <laughs> that, that, my, that he comes at my enemies, that he sees and has the vision. He comes to the edge where I'm at. He comes into the middle where he sees the predator. He comes near me and he defends me because he is my defender. I have comfort in knowing that though I'm walking through this life and the enemies are coming at me, that the presence of God is with me and my God carries a big stick and it doesn't matter when the enemy's coming after me, my God gets in front of me and says, you've got to go through me. To get to them. So his rod, and, and there's, a, there's an additional definition that's there, and, I, and I'm, I'm waiting to the end because it brings power and responsibility. Huh. Listen, I need you to understand something. Even when you feel like the enemy is devouring you, you are still within the protective rights of the shepherd. And he will not give up on you. Even when you feel like you're out on the edge, unguarded, unprotected. That's why the Bible says, call on the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. It's not just about salvation, ladies and gentlemen. As a church, as a, as a, a sheep, having a connection with the shepherd, call on his name and he will save you. It not only is birthed in a place of intimate relationship with the shepherd, hearing him and practicing his presence in my life. But secondly, he says staff. Now, interestingly enough, the same can be said of the word staff. In fact, in the Hebrew, the, the word for staff are kind of interchangeable, but they have different purposes and different Uses. As far as the usage, the staff was used by the shepherd as a stick to lean on when walking through areas leading the sheep. It was also used to pull sheep back into the fold. The staff was also a symbol, and here's what's powerful. The staff was a symbol of prophetic, priestly, kingly, or royal offices. So here he is, and he says, all right, God, you're my defender. I'm thankful you, your rod brings comfort because you've got my back. You've got the enemy. You, you're handling that for me. But your staff also brings comfort because it's that one thing that when you see me on the edge, you do kind of hook me and pull me in. When, you, when you're walking with it, you're walking as the absolute authority in my life, and you carry with it, a, a, as a shepherd, you carry the, the, the prophetic, the priestly, and the royal office. Now I'll say this. There is only one person in scripture. Who was a prophet, priest, and king. And it wasn't David. It was Jesus. So David, when he is making this allusion to the staff, he's not just saying, oh, the shepherd staff of having this position that's prophetic where he can speak into my life and having this position of priestly where he can pray for me and comfort me and having this, this uh, authority in my life. He's speaking of, in a prophetic sense, he's speaking about Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you that life with Jesus, walking through this life with Jesus, by far brings victory 
so much better than walking alone. We need Jesus. We need more Jesus. Anybody agree with that? See, the staff, the staff kept the shepherd steady as he led through sometimes the rough areas of wilderness that might prove treacherous otherwise. The staff could also have been used as a defensive weapon against attacks by anyone or anything, anyone, anyone seeking to steal or devour the sheep. But this last usage, the reference, the, the prophet, the priest, and the king puts it all into perspective. It's about Jesus. It's a typology of Jesus. So if you take the rod and staff and combine them together, you see that Jesus is our one defense against death, hell, and the grave. He defeated sin upon the cross, breaking forever the curse of sin which was upon us and binding up sin's entanglements so that we are not held in bondage to them anymore. He is the one we can lean on in treacherous times knowing that He will never fail us. How many of you know that Jesus will never fail you? Now, I mean, really, don't just say amen. Do you know it? There's a difference between saying amen because... Because you agree with something and saying amen because you know something. We can't just say, oh, I agree that Jesus is my protector. And I agree that Jesus is my shepherd. And I agree that Jesus is my prophet, priest, king. And I I agree with those things, but I don't know it. We've got to get to the place of knowing it. Hmm. He is also, Jesus has sent the Holy Spirit to walk alongside us in order to aid us in this life as we go along, speaking and bringing back every word of truth that Jesus spoke, redefining our reality, not by what we see, by what, but by what Jesus has said. Listen, your reality is not what you see. Your reality is what Jesus has said. Your reality is not what you see and what you are living. Your reality is what the word of God has determined. That, that lets me know that if, you're, if, if the word tells me that no enemy can stand against you, then yeah, the reality may be that there's an enemy that's standing against you, but the word of God tells you with, de- with definition that yeah, he may stand against you, but he's not going to win. Because in the end, he can't stand against you. It, 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 the, the Word of God tells me how to think and how to see and how to be and how to carry myself. It tells me all of these things. So it's not me trying to make it all up on the fly. It's hearing Jesus because I'm in communion with Him. It's me hearing Him as He speaks because He's my shepherd and I'm attentive to His voice. And when He speaks and where He goes, I follow Him. He comes face to face with me because I can, as a sheep, I recognize His face see some other people that try to mimic his look, but I see him and he's the one that I come to. And so in this relationship that David is presenting for us, ladies and gentlemen, this is a call not to your normal Christian 21st century American life. Where everything else has a place at the seat, of the, uh, 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 has a seat at the table with you. This is a call to get back to what really matters and what really matters is Jesus. Jesus has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit to walk this life with us. It's why we we have Jesus. We are transformed by his blood in this world. You may look the same on the outside, but you are not the same on the inside. There's a difference in you. And when we walk through this life with Jesus having changed the inside, ladies and gentlemen, you can walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You can see the evils on every side. You can see them standing in your way. You can see them standing on the high ridge, having the, high, having the advantage of attack upon you. You can see it getting darker and darker and darker and because the sun is less shining through that ridged area. You can see it all the way as you walk through, but you can still walk through because the prophet, priest, king is walking in front of you. He's leading you and guiding you. He's saying, this is the way. Don't be afraid. Keep on going. Come on, let's go. Let's go together because I'm not leaving you. I'm not forsaking you. I'm going in front of you. I will defend you. I will speak to you. I will order your steps. I will show you the way so that even when you walk through this life and you see all of this stuff coming after you, 
you don't have to be afraid of what they might do because you'll be understanding that they really can't do anything. We don't, but we don't, we don't live like this, do we? Pastor, David was a simple fellow. He didn't have all of the same troubles that we have. What? David didn't, wasn't even wanted by his own family. You want to talk about somebody who understood being abandoned? David understood abandonment. And it didn't matter. The shepherd was with him. David understood other people in leadership wanting to kill him. But it didn't matter because the shepherd was with him. David understood living in, living in the land of the enemy. I mean, he lived in, in, in with the Philistines because he was kind of, he, he had to go. He was living with the Philistines, but he had a shepherd who was with him. I, I'm telling you, yes, times might have been different back then, but it was the exact same troubles. It was the exact same fears. Because, listen, the enemy's a one-trick pony. He only has a few things he can do. And he just figures out how to repackage them really well. So it looks like it's something new, but it's not. And so be mindful of that. That's why Paul tells us we are not ignorant of the enemy's scheme. We know that he comes about roaring as a lion. It doesn't say that he comes as a roaring lion. It says he comes roaring as a lion, which means that he's mimicking the sound of a lion, but he's not a lion. So there's a third part of this that I want you to gather. And I'm, I'm, I'm closing, and, and I've actually I've got a video that, that we're going to watch here in just a minute uh, that I want you to see because, goodness gracious, it is so powerful for you to understand what, uh, what this big picture, it pulls it all together, at least it did for me, and that's why I'm, I, I, I wanted to share that video with you. But remember that I had mentioned at the beginning one final definition to get to. You see, while the word rod means a club, and you can interchange it with staff, and staff means, uh, staff has that prophetic, that priestly, that, that kingly position in your life, the, uh, and, and the, the rod has this idea of, of defense and this idea of beating. There's, a, there's another word that shocked me to even see, because the word rod has a, a second definition, and the second definition is amazing. It's this. Tribe. Tribe. So it's not just your stick comforts me, it's your tribe comforts me. Now hear that. How often do we use the phrase, this is my tribe? We use it every day. We talk about the groups that we hang out with. This is my tribe. These are my people. We have similar likes. We have this, so we call it tribe. And, and here it is. That what David thought of this long before any of us did. He says, your, your rod your, is comforting. Your defense comforts me. But I also gain defense not just with you being in front of me swinging your big bat to, to, to ward off and destroy enemies. I'm also comforted in the warring position of being part of your tribe. Don't miss that, church. You know what that means? That means that the community of faith is vital. Do you know? Listen, a, a, any good shepherd, do you know what they do with the sheep that run off? They never leave them. Now, we could go and say, okay, yeah, when a sheep wanders off, after they've wandered off several times, a, a, a shepherd will do one thing. He will break his legs. And he'll carry him back, and he'll help him mend, and he'll do those things. But what about the one guy that gets out maybe maybe 
two or three times, but not like a, a, a whole excessive amount of time. He'll, he'll get him. And the only way that he can train him to stay connected is to put him in the fat middle of the community. That's where he puts him. Puts him in the middle of the sheep. Doesn't let them get to the edge of the sheep because the more connected he is in here, in the centering of the community, the more they're communicating, the more they're protecting, the more they're guarding, the more they're watching. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the whole reason why the body of Christ is so important yes. to be a part of. Yes. 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 Amen. This is why when we, when we come together, you should be here. Don't forsake the assembling of the brethren together because God treats his tribe as a defense mechanism for you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but pastor, what about the guys that are, in the, that, that are in the group that are so abusive and they're so ugly? Listen, pray for them because if God doesn't change their attitude, hell will sure do it. Amen. We've been ugly with each other for far too long. And the whole reason is because we refuse to be a part of the tribe with someone that it requires we defend them. It requires that we have enough connection with them to guard them, to be speaking into their life. So we don't. We speak ugly. We want to fracture. We cause division. How do I know? 120 churches in Mount Pleasant. Are you kidding me? And it just keeps going like a vicious cycle. Because somebody got offended. And somebody did this. And the pastor said that. And he got on my nerves. And he didn't preach what I wanted him to. And, 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 or, or whatever it is. And we just keep fracturing, keep fracturing, keep fracturing, keep fracturing. And so we say things like, oh, uh, yeah, I go to church. Well, where do you go? I go to, uh, you know, I go to, uh, uh, I go to, I go to an Assemblies of God church. Well, there's like four. Which one do you go to? Why are there four Assemblies of God churches? Well, there's actually six Assemblies of God churches in Mount Pleasant. Three English speaking and three Spanish speaking. Six. Because we don't want to be a tribe. Because we have misunderstood that God uses us to defend one another. To encourage one another. To be there for one another. That's why Paul is able to say, rejoice with those that rejoice and weep with those who weep. What affects one affects all. Stub the toe, my body heals at me. Why? Because it's a oneness that we're supposed to have, ladies and gentlemen. We need each other. We need each other. The people that aren't here, stop writing them off. Bring them back in. Get them into the center of the community. Gather around them. That does mean there's confrontation. That does mean that there is those come to Jesus moments. That does mean that you got to pray for one another. That does mean all of those things that we've talked about because God uses it for our good. Yes. 